Okay, Michael Friedman, introduce yourself. So, I'm Michael Friedman, and I recently changed jobs. I now work for a company called Polyvore, which d runs a fashion social commerce website. Um, it's a little hard to describe, but you, you can probably guess. Um, it involves letting people interact with fa items of fashion, you know, fancy clothing and high-end stuff, and um, mixing and matching, and then shopping for them. It works really well, actually. And my current project, since I just started there, was writing an address book. They have a starter project where everyone, every new person who comes on board writes an address book as a way to learn their infrastructure for accessing the database, building web pages, that kind of stuff. It worked out really well, but, you know, it's kind of throwaway. Okay. So, okay. Before we begin. Now, okay, without further ado, we'll have Michael Friedman do his presentation on ProNextML. Thank you. Thank you, Lambert. Um, so, as I said, um, uh, I recently changed jobs, but my old job, I worked um, with a couple of these guys for about 14 years at Stanford, working with XML data. Um, it started out as SGML data, became HTML kind of in the middle there, and then once XML was actually invented and available, we uh, changed to XML. So, um, I know a little bit of something about XML. Um, and that's why I thought uh, I would be able to do a presentation on it. So, shall we get started? I have cool technology here. Um, so, this is going to be an introduction and an overview to XML and Perl. Um, there isn't a lot of time to go into a ton of details. What I thought would be more useful for everyone would be kind of an, uh, an overview of, you know, what XML is for those people who don't know and kind of a review of how do you work with it because picking the right tool for the job is 80% of the battle and I think a lot of people who do work with XML just use whatever they're used to and don't know how many options there are out there. So, um, either, whether you know a ton about XML, whether you know too much about XML, whether you know nothing at all, I hope there's something you can get out of this talk. Um, there will be code samples at the end and the talk, I timed it, it runs a little short, so feel free to interrupt me and ask questions at any point. So, XML, what we're going to talk about today, or what I'm going to talk about, is what is it, why you would want to use it, the way it's handled in Perl, the way it's implemented, and a number of useful CPAN modules for dealing with it. So, starting right off, what is XML? If you don't already know, XML is a lot like HTML. In fact, this is technically an HTML document, but without this uh, doc type at the top, it could also be an XHTML document, which is a variant of HTML that's actually valid XML. The things that make this special, that make XML special, is that it uses, it's a markup language. It has elements, it has attributes, and it has text in between them. Um, you've all used HTML, I assume, or at least, you know, looked at it at some point. This is a perfectly valid XML document, but XML is a lot more than HTML. XML. Come on, go ahead, sir. So XML is a lot more than HTML. For example, you can do totally different things that look a little like HTML, but because they're XML, they get to define their data in a more precise manner. So this is the same kind of thing. It has elements between uh, angle brackets, has attributes, and it has text inside of it. However, it gets to make up its own names for everything. So in this case, this is a um, journal element from Medline. Medline is a collection of information about biomedical documents that have been published since about 1965. It's got millions of records in it. One for every article that's been published, more or less, in uh, medicine and biology. And the way they describe it all is in a very complex XML structure. And we'll see more of this as we go along, because these are my examples for the whole talk. But I just wanted to point out that because you can rename these things, you can do a ton of stuff with this. For example, this is also an XML document. This may be one you've seen before. This is a Tomcat config file. 
Tomcat decided to use XML for their configuration files. It's got the same kinds of things. It's got elements and it's got, well, they don't use attributes very much. Um, but um, this is a good example of the kind of structured data you can put in XML. For example, it's got arrays. We have an array down here of context params. They're just all listed one after another and they're treated as an array. There are hashes. For example, session <coughs> config has a number of key value components inside it. There are parent-child relationships, um, which are farther down in the file. But, you know, like you can see here that um, an ENV entry has many things for it. It's as if it's an object of some sort. Again, because they get to define exactly what the elements are, you can make this a very specific document. It can be very useful because of... Oops. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, it can be very useful because of that definition. However, you could also do this in other formats. In particular, something like JSON. So, why would you want to use XML instead of those other things? In particular, JSON, because I have a tiny bit of experience with it. Um, there are other, you know, CSV files, that kind of stuff. There's a lot of ways to store data. Why use XML? Well, I have three good reasons. There are a number of other reasons, and you may hear others bandied about, but I think these three kind of get to the core of why you care. The first one is, you have to. Certain things, such as Apache 2 configs and Tomcat configs, are XML files. If you want to automate the creation of those, if you want to automate the updating of these, you're going to be using XML tools. It's just the way it works. The Apache Foundation, they love XML. Don't know why, but they do. So you're going to find this across their, uh, their um, product set. It seems to love XML too. Um, a lot of Apple config files. You, know, you mean dramatic. like Apple Plus oh, files? sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sorry. exactly. Apple loves XML as well, and they do have all sorts of stuff. Now, Plus also have a binary representation, and so they kind of go back and forth on which one they're going to use most of the time. But when you edit a file, what you do is you convert the binary back to XML, you edit it, and then you convert it back to binary if you need to. Um, lastly, the Medline data set I just showed you an example of, and many other data transfer formats happen to be in XML. If you want to work with them, you're going to learn XML, you're going to use it. So, the pragmatic reason, somebody else has decided you're going to use XML. Kind of a design philosophical reason is it's style data. If you're working with style data, you need to be able to put both the data itself and the styling information or the metadata about it in one place. If you want to put that in one file, there's no better common format than XML. And this is where things like JSON begin to fall down. JSON is great for recording the data, but if you want to record metadata about the data, for example, this should be bold or this should be italic, then you either have to build this complex structure or you have to have some separate component that contains the style information. So some of the examples of style data that happen to be using XML or XML-like um, uh, languages are, you know, HTML, of course, and it's because an EPUB, I don't know if you've ever looked in an EPUB document, but it's basically a zipped up um, HTML container with HTML5 files and CSS files. It's got a limited vocabulary and a few customizations, which, because it's XML, you can get away with. But, um, again, these are style data. They're article presentation data. Of course, if you're working with articles, like, you know, not, a, not just on blogs, but, you know, the Medline data or... Um, I used to work with Highwire Press, and we got all of our data in XML format. If you work with printers or magazines or journals or newspapers, they're all using XML for the style data. And um, finally, even Microsoft realized that XML was a really important thing. So their, their beloved .doc format, they created an XML version of it, .docx. Now, why would they do that when they have a perfectly good binary format, dot dot? Well, that's the third reason. Because nothing beats text for if it really, truly has to be cross-platform. If you want to get this data onto, say, my old Apple Newton, 
it had better be text because it won't read anything binary. It won't read PDFs, it won't read anything. If you want to get that Word document across to, say, Linux, well, too bad, but if it's a .docx <laughs> file, you can still use tools to deal with it. You don't have Word, but if it's an XML format file, you can use XML tools to read it, to update it, to send it back over the network, to do whatever you need to do with it. There are some very specific examples of this cross-platformness. Um, in particular, I'm thinking of protocols that are designed to be cross-platform, like SOAP or XML RPC. These are cases where you may be talking from, you know, who knows what machine and who knows other machine. You guys in network monitoring probably use XML RPC. No, really? Too slow? <laughs> okay. Well, um, I used to work at a place that was um, going with SOAP across the board because they were dealing with Microsoft servers. Microsoft servers use SOAP and all of their weird surrounding. And um, because these protocols are really, really, tru truly cross-platform, they're a text format. The best way to do that is XML. Um, in addition, there's mainframes. Binary formats don't work very well if you're trying to go to a mainframe. Mainframe COBOL does still exist. Just ask the banking industry. Just ask <laughs> the insurance industry. These guys have so much money spent on mainframes and mainframe systems. They're not going to change in our lifetimes. They are slowly getting there. But, you know, they've been working on this for 20 years and not succeeding. You know, you, 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 you said that, but, um, what we do do, though, with the next this is actually related to the social next model. So we have people who want to look at, you know, have, have us expose data. Mm -hmm. Right, there's a lot of things. For example, WordPress can export your blog in XML. It's the same concept as SOAP or XML RPC. We just don't use those standards because they get it out. <laughs> you know, I looked at WSSL at one point and um, I completely understand. <laughs> Man, if you have a choice, do not use SOAP. Use XML RPC over SOAP, but really avoid both, as, he, as Michael points out. Um, in addition to mainframes and, you know, kind of attached, binary formats don't do well when you're transferring from big endian to little endian machines or vice versa. I have a PowerPC Mac at home. You know, I have to actually go through a translation <laughs> mode when I want to get things over to it. I forget whether it's big endian or little endian versus Intel or vice versa, but whatever. Just text formats are cross-platform more than binary formats. So, as we saw, even Microsoft is getting into the text format world. And when they wanted to do it, dot, dot, X, because it's XML, and it's kind of the common format. You know, if you want to expose data to someone else, it's probably XML, because everyone kind of knows how to speak it. So, how do you work with this stuff? How does Perl work with this stuff is what I'd like to start with first. I got some bad news. It's all C. Every last bit of it is C. Some of it's hidden better than others, but they're all written in C because pure Perl solutions are too slow. I don't know why. I haven't tried to optimize them. I have thankfully not had to work on it, but I've tried pure Perl implementations because I love pure Perl. It just, they don't cut it. So basically there are three main XML parsers in the Perl world. There's XPAT, Xerxes, and LibXML. And I don't want to go into a ton of uh, detail about them, but they're all complex. That's why a lot of people choose JSON or other simpler formats, because you're working with XML. So HTML has a prescribed data set. Everyone knows the you know, 100 or so elements you can have and the 200 or so attributes you can use. And you can mix and match, but it's a limited data set. With XML, you can make up all your own names. And so it's very complex. And that's kind of why these are all big, complicated, and written in C. Sorry. Yeah. But, okay, so I'm, I'm not really sure about this, but I thought Pro was used, in, you know, for, in, you know, gene splicing and sequencing and all that because of pattern recognition. Capability. Yes. So you'd think if it was good enough for DNA and everything, it'd be good enough for... Uh, 
XML. I don't know. DNA is usually represented as a sequence of letters. Okay. Single letters. Single letters. Okay. There's no parsing. There are only four letters. Okay. Now, when you start going into proteins and you know bigger uh, constructs, you get into abbreviations and, and whatnot. But they're not using XML for that data. Okay. Because it's not structured data. It's not style data. It's yes. a string. Yeah. Okay. You know, you start here. You follow the sequence to the other end, and you stop. Okay. And you may cut chunks out of it, but it's always sequential data. XML is overkill for sequential data. Right. No, I didn't mean to use XML for for that. I just, I just, you know, curl is isn't quite, you know, strong enough or whatever for yeah. the XML parsing that we did enough for. I don't know why. Well, yeah. I don't know why. The biggest issue there is is more to do with the DBT or the schema that you have to validate against. That. That's true. If you're doing DTD validation, so a DTD is a document type definition. Um, HTML has a DTD that tells you what the valid elements and attributes are and such. You're representing a tree in memory. So right. Well, not always in memory. Well, but you're well, representing a tree. You're representing a, a tree faster. of data, and C is faster. But you know, like most most biology data is not tree related. But you know, they're starting to use XML as a transfer format. So, but yeah, I have no idea why it's so slow, other than it's doing a ton of work because it's so generic. So the point that also he's making is not that Perl cannot parse XML. I'm sure you can write a oh, yeah. perfect pure Perl parser, and it would work great. But when you put it in a web server and expect that it to respond to people, oh, I see. It, would, it would use too much of your resources for it to get. These C libraries are highly optimized so that they can do an enormous amount of work in a reasonable amount of time. Okay. Yeah. I see. So you don't have to work with the C library directly. You get to use Perl modules on CPAN that wrap these libraries. And I don't want to get into too much detail because they're they're complex and we want to move on. But I can get into more detail later if you want. I just wanted to take a you know a brief look at each one. So XPAT is implemented in Perl as XML parser. The reason for this is because XPAT is kind of the oldest XML engine. It was written by James Clark, who helped invent XML. And um, because it was first, it got to use the namespace XML parser. Um, however, because it was first, it's also the weirdest from a modern point of view. Um, like all of these parsers and other kinds of parsers, you create the parsing object first, and you can give it certain information and configuration stuff. And then you parse a file, and then it gives you back a tree in memory that you can use accessors to deal with. XML parser can also work in an event handling style and you can let you can give it handlers for characters and various elements and things. And we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but the the API is a bit of a mess. It doesn't always work the way you think it does. And um, it hasn't been updated since 2007. <laughs> so it doesn't support XML2 and XPath2. It doesn't support um, some of the latest, coolest things you can do with it. So, slightly better than XML parser is Xerxes. Um, Xerxes is the Apache Project's XML parser. So, they love XML, they wrote their own parser. The Xerxes parser is a pain in the ass. In fact, it's such a pain in the ass that you don't really want to use XML Xerxes. You want to use a wrapping module that wraps XML Xerxes, like XML Xerxes Bag of Tricks. <laughs> you want to go a whole other layer up to get something that you can use to deal with this parser. I... Indirection can solve any problem except excess indirection. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, the, the, the trick here is that, you know, there are places that use Xerxes, and there are places that use XML Xerxes. And every person I've talked to who's used it has a project on the books to get rid of it and replace it with the next one, libxml. But it's too complex, or it's too tied into the system, or whatever. We can't do it right now. We'll get around to it. <laughs> so you will still see XML Xerxes in various places. Um, but I highly recommend not dealing with it either, if you can help it. Um, dun -dun 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 -dun. This is also old as well. It hasn't been updated since 2006. So it, again, doesn't support the latest features of XML and um, XPath and all these fun things. It may or may not surprise you, 
that Xerxes is the de facto default XML parser for Java. Because the Apache project gives it away, it's in Tomcat built in, and, you know, therefore everybody's got a copy of the Xerxes parser, parser in Java. So, there are some places that use Xerxes from Java to parser XML, and they think mistakenly that they also have to use Xerxes on the Perl side, so that they can talk to one another. This is patently false. XML is a cross-platform transfer format. You can deal with it however you like, so I recommend avoiding Xerxes if at all possible. The best option of these three low-level parsers is libxml. libmxml, it's technically libxml2, but no one ever talks about version 1. Um, it's actively being developed. It's designed for modern procedural languages like Perl and Python. It happens to be the um, more or less default go-to XML parser for Perl at this point. Um, it's fast, it's straightforward, there are lots of tutorials, and the documentation is actually quite good. Is it current? Yeah. Um, it's got the latest X XML and XPath uh, features in it, and if you're using a modern version of LibXML, which some shops are not, like my old one, um, <laughs> you can do all sorts of cool stuff with X LibXML. Um, I recommend it, but it's still really quite complicated. I mean, you can look here, and it's basically you're walking down a tree. So, you create your parser, you parse your file, and then you've got nodes, and children, and um, parents. You know, you, you, can, you have your low-level stuff for walking through the tree, but it's still pretty complex. Which brings us to the most important topic of my talk. How do we really deal with this in the real world? Well, there's only one answer to that, and I bet every single one of you knows it. <laughs> um, there are hundreds of modules on CPAN that deal with XML because it's such a pain in the ass. And I couldn't possibly go through all of them. Everybody has their favorite, everyone has their pet peeves. Um, but what I wanted to do was kind of go over a few of my, for lack of a better word, favorites and talk about what they are, what they do, and kind of the, the space of potential solutions. Um, if you look up here, this is just a very small sampling. If you want to talk about other ones that are not on this list, please jump in, or we can talk about it at the end. If you have questions, I have used XML processing modules that are not on this list. I have not actually used this one yet, and I have not really used XML Twig much, but I've used all the rest. Um, so, you know, let's go through these and we'll see where we stand and then we can, you know, get into other modules. So, the first set, what I'm calling XML specifications. If you were using a file type that automatically comes in XML format, like Tomcat config files, like Apache config files, like Atom feeds and RSS feeds and OPML, or even SVG, someone has probably written a module and put it on CPAN to deal with that for you. This is great! This is fantastic, because then you don't have to care that it's in XML under the hood. When you look at it, you deal with the semantic content you want. So, uh, I, can you all see that, or is that too small? It's pretty small. It's pretty small. Well, it's we'll all blurry. I'll blow it up later. <laughs> it's blurry, isn't it? I think it's just because it's small. Well, anyway, what I wanted to show here was that... Um, when you deal with, this is XML Atom, and when you deal with XML Atom, you don't deal with the XML. You say, I want to get a URI from this Atom entry, and so get all the links from it. You make one call, get you all the links. You uh, grep through that list of links, looking at the relationships, and then you pull out the href from each one, and you return the one you want. You don't actually care that it's XML under the hood. You don't care that it's binary under the hood. You just, somebody else has written this for you. Now, you may need to expand on this. You may need to extend it. In which case, knowing XML is good. Um, but generally, this is the easiest way to deal with XML. So, if you get a new file type, go look and see whether someone's already written a module to deal with it. That's my number one piece of advice from this whole talk. So, yeah. is Atom a file type? Yeah, so um, uh, RSS is a, a format for syndication feeds. Atom is another format for syndication feeds. Atom is newer. Uh, dare I say, fancier, um, but less well-known. The trick is that every RSS reader on the planet also reads Atom feeds, 
And so most of the time someone will say this is an RSS feed, but under the hood it may actually be an Atom feed. And you don't know and you don't care because your program deals with it for you. Um, some people can do things with XML Atom that would make your hair stand on end. Um, but it is, it's kind of the successor to RSS. And more and more sites are using it now. Um, okay. If you can't find a specific CPAN module that does what you want, then I recommend XML Simple. Just like it says, it is simple. It turns XML into a hash. It kind of, sort of, will round trip it and write it out for you. And it works great for very simple XML files. Um, as you can see here from the sample, or you could, basically it turns it into a multi-layered hash. So you've got, you know, hash elements, and you've got um, keys and keys and keys, and you go, you know, two or three or four or five levels deep, depending on your XML file. But overall, you don't have to learn the API. You don't have to even know much about the XML itself. You read in the file, it becomes a Perl hash, and you deal with it. And when you're done, you can write out the hash, and as long as you had all your fiddly configuration settings right, it'll be round trip. Um, yeah? Okay, um, actually I should testify of uh, XML simple is uh, using this. I mean, for, I mean, for those people who haven't actually tried using this, uh, the reason why it's so good is because normally we, if you're trying to get an element in an XML document, you have to navigate down there, and that takes you know, five function calls, ten function calls, I don't know how many different function calls. Um, once, with XML Simple, once something is processed into XML Simple, all you do is you have one line in which you're indexing, in which you're indexing one after another, after another, after another. And that's a si single line itself. So it doesn't matter if it's five levels deep, you just have one line there with five indexes one after another. And then you have that element that you want. Because sometimes that's all you really want. You just want one little thing out of an XML document, that's it. Yeah, no, it, it's really awesome for that. It doesn't work on really long files, because again, it's got to bring the whole thing into memory. Um, but at least it doesn't keep the XML tree in memory, it only keeps the hash, so as it reads in the file, it makes the hash and then throws away the XML. So it'll work on decent sized things. Um, and I highly recommend it as a first cut on any XML data you've got. One of the great things that you'd think you could do with this would be, hey, I want to make an object. So I have an XML file. Let's say I have 30,000 XML files. I want to make an object for each one. Well, you read in your hash, and hey, you bless it, and there's your object. That works. Works pretty well. But if you're using Moose, there's an even better way. XML Rabbit. <laughs> XML Rabbit is awesome. It turns XML into a Moose object, is amazingly concise. You can look right there. This is the entire object definition for Moose. It tells it what the fields are, it tells it where in the XML file to get the data for it, and it, uh, it's got its finalized class down at the bottom. All set. You can build Moose objects out of XML files using XML Rabbit in mere minutes. It is fantastic. It is more or less brand new. It was invented last year. Um, Everybody got really excited about it when it came out. I haven't had a chance to use it in a production environment, but just from playing with it, man, this is awesome. If you use Moose, look into XML Rabbit. Totally worth it. Now, one of the reasons it's so concise is it uses XPath to define where the uh, data is. Now, as you were saying, when you go to look at one element way down, like six layers deep, you have to walk through the tree, find the nodes, find the children, check for errors the whole time, and so on and so forth. XPath gets around that. So I'm going to take a momentary diversion and talk a little bit about XPath, because XPath is the next best thing to slice bread. XPath, the XML path language, is a query language for selecting nodes from an XML document from Wikipedia. That is technically correct. It is also factually correct. It is a query language for selecting items from an XML document. You have an XML document, you can build an XPath query that goes and looks things up in it. It's like you use SQL to look things up in a relational database, you use XPath to look things up inside an XML document. When you're going six or seven layers deep, this is really handy because it lets you do things in one line that you would otherwise have to do walking the tree. For example, this is an example of an XPath. 
Meta learns how to take slash. They all start with slash. It's a path-like syntax. So like you were doing a URL or like you were doing paths on your file system. This is, say you got an element medline citation at the top level because there's nothing in front of the slash. Say it has a child named article and that has a child named article title. This XPath expression will give you that node. You can um, get the text out of that node just by doing arrow and um, text content, I think the actual thing is. And there you go, you're done. You don't have to walk the tree, XPath will do it for you. XPath makes XML awesome. You want a parsing module, an XML parser, that deals with XPath. Guess which, guess which one does the best job? LibXML, because it's the newest. They had a revision to XPath, there was a version 1.0, then they came out with 2.0. 2.0 is just tons better. You can do things like, um, you can e use attributes, so you can say, there's an ISN, ISSN element, and it has a ISSN type attribute. And by putting this in square brackets, you say, this is a look ahead assertion. You can say, I want the Medline citation slash journal slash ISSN where this attribute is true, or where whatever's in the square brackets is true. So you can basically do, you know, value checking. There are a whole bunch of um, methods and functions you can use inside there. It's just, it's awesome. If you want to pull data out of an XML file, use XPath if you can possibly help it. I want to mention, I don't want to talk about too much of the syntax, but I want to mention one shortcut, which is slash slash. Six levels deep. Use slash slash, you don't care. Slash slash says, go down the tree until you find one that matches. I don't care how many layers you go, I don't care how far you go, just keep going. Now, if you're looking for the best performance, you're going to want to avoid this, but for most purposes, since Perl is going to be slower than whatever else you're doing or whatever's running the XPath, this will be great. Saves you a ton of time, especially in prototyping. If there's more than one occurrence, do you get a list or is it stuck in it? depends on which call you're using, um, but... I mean, for the, for the shortcut. No, no, no. I, it, it depends on which call and which module you're calling it okay. from. So in, if you're using libxml, there's two uh, function calls. One... No, you're right. If there's more than one, it returns an array. If there's just one, it returns the node itself. What it actually returns is a node list, which is an... Uh, libxml is all object-oriented, and so it returns a node list, which you can then iterate through and get all your nodes out of it. Um, you can also treat it directly li like an array, and you can say, you know, bracket zero, bracket, arrow, text content, and get the content out of the, the first one. Um, but you can use this in conjunction with the square brackets to find the one you want. So if you want the author, and there are 12 authors on this, you know, academic journal paper, and you want the corresponding author, well, you say author where at corresponding equals true. And that'll give you just the one back out of 12 or 15 or however many authors there are. Um, XPath. Awesome. If you're working with XML, it behooves you to learn XPath. It's a whole other language, but just like when you work with databases, you learn SQL. If you work with XML on a regular basis, you should learn XPath. Anyway, so if you aren't using Moose, you won't be using XML Rabbit, but you still want to use XPath in a more easy fashion than going straight to libxml. So there's XML XPath. See fan to the rescue. XML XPath is the power of XPath, the ease of Perl. Awesome. Come in here, it creates a parser based on a string. You just go find, you give it an XPath expression, and there you go. It returns the nodes, you walk through the nodes, you pull out the data you want. Um, this one in particular is looking at an HTML document. Well, <laughs> technically XHTML, but, you know, close enough. Um, it's easy to use. It's a bit limited. For example, it can't write XML. XML XPath can only read. It's just a query language. But in most cases, you know, in many cases, you're just going to be reading these files. You're not going to be writing them. You know, if you're um, looking up data in the Medline data set, you're not going to be rewriting these files. You're going to be looking things up. So. You know, you've got one big file with, you know, 30,000 records in it, and you go hunt things down using XML XPath. Works great. Um, it's low memory, too. It's low footprint, so it works on large files. Um, it has a pure Perl implementation. 
which is, as I said, incredibly slow. But if you're working on a system with no C compiler, it, it's there, it works. You know, you wouldn't want to run your website on it, but for background processing, it works great. Um, and it's built on XML SACS, which is a, what did I say? It's an event handler stream parsing model. What I mean by that is, let's say your XML files are really big. Let's say they're 650 megabytes, or let's say they're a gigabyte. Let's say they're two gig, if you're looking at, you know, really big SVG documents. Um, you can be able to parse that into a tree and fit that in memory. In most cases, with Perl, your memory is going to be limited. Someone will have capped the system at 30 meg per process or 50 meg per process or whatever, and you want to strangle them, but there it is. So sometimes, for really big files, what you need to do is you need to do this event handling model. In the event handling model, what you do is you create a handler, and the module streams the XML file past it. And every time it sees the one that matches, it pulls it out and does something with it. So if you create a handler that looks for um, H1 tags, and you throw it the biggest HTML file you can find, it's only going to deal with the H1 tag. It will not deal with anything else. Now there are some tricks to this. For example, you have to define a separate handler for the start tag and the end tag. And then you have to keep track of your own state in between them. Because what it's getting is event. So event, start tag found. Event, end tag found. You have to be keeping track when you hit the start tag to say, okay, this is my current tag. And when you hit the end tag to say, I want all the text that has passed since you last hit the start tag, and I want you to save it over here. So it's complex to write. I recommend against it if you don't have to do it, but if you're writing a parser that parses XML to some other XML format, this is a reasonable way to go. Um, it's relatively fast. It works on humongous files. And... Yeah. There are um, two main ones. XML Sacks and XML Twig. Um, I recommend XML Twig. It's newer, it's easier. XML Sacks is older, um, a little more complex to work with, but a lot of CPAN modules are built on XML Sacks. For example, XML Simple is built on top of XML Sacks, which is built on top of XML Parser, XPAC. When you go in the Perl debugger and you look at these things, you're going to start tracing through code that you don't ever want to see ever again. Um, but it's good to know how XML SACS works, because when you have a bug in your XML simple, you can say, oh, okay, you know, I can walk through this and figure out why it's happening the way it is. You know, why is it making this into, why is it concatenating all these strings together instead of making an array out of them? Well, go look at the handlers and you can see what it's doing. Oh, there's an option here to make it an array. Cool. Uh, so okay, the well, last kind, yeah. Okay, oh, actually it's, uh, XML trick is actually one of my favorites. So. The, uh, oh, that's right. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I, yeah. I think that's the thing. That's um, I think I mentioned it to you, and then I think you included in your presentation. Um, okay. Anyway, XML trig. The reason why I use um, the reason why I find XML trig intriguing is because uh, not only is it event based, but um, if you want to, you can actually drop down and turn it into tree processing. You know, actually convert the entire thing to tree. Um, actually, it goes to the point where you can actually. Um, you can actually convert it into a format that's like XML simple. You know, mm -hmm. So if you like to output XML simple, it was like, I think it's a function called like simplify or something like that. It's been a long time since I used it, but um, yeah. you can tell it to say, okay, I want something like XML simple and just, and it'll dump out a pro data structure for you right there on the spot. Um, typically you do this um, once you reach a certain part of the tree that you don't care about what's above, but you only care about the stuff that's below. You know, so if you want to have just a portion of the tree that you want and you don't care about anything above, you just say, okay, grab that part, okay, turn it into a data tree I can work with. Okay, and you know, typically at that point it's like then I say I say simplify, and it's like and it pours out a, a pro data structure I can actually use. Yeah, that's why it's called twig. So you're branching <laughs> through the document. And when you get to the, the not quite the leaf nodes, but between the big branches and the leaf nodes you have the twigs. And so XML twig is, is great for what Lambert was saying, where you want to deal with this small portion of the document, and then you want to just dump it out into like a hash or a format you want to deal with. 
Um, XML Sax is kind of a ground up, build your own XML parser kind of thing. Um, but, you know, it's been around longer and there's, there's a lot of things to use it. With the, with the tweak, can you do the um, XPath and then get the subtree like and then... I do don't it? remember whether XML Twig does XPath. Oh, no. Does. Oh, it does? Oh, <coughs> oh, awesome. So, yes. Yeah, it's been around for quite a while, too. Yeah, it's okay. been like 10 years, maybe. So... So you don't have to do the screen parsing if you don't want to. You can use the um, XPath and then get the... The right, right, and, and it, it's doing most of the stream. I mean, it, so XML Sax has no default handlers at all. Okay. And XML Twig has default handlers that let you do things like the simplify. Okay. So, you know, I recommend Twig over Sax. Um, uh, this is an example Twig handler. We'll get to it later if you want. So, um, the last section of stuff I want to talk about is XML languages. I'm sorry. Sometimes Perl is not good enough. Sometimes you want to do something with XML that Perl is not, shall we say, optimized for. Um, and you need to go use a purpose-built language that's built for dealing with huge XML files. Um, some of these are XSLT and XQuery, which is um, used by MarkLogic as a uh, XML fragment store database. Um, in both of these cases, it's a whole other language. You know, you write a file in XSLT, it's called a style sheet. Um, XSLT stands for XML Style Sheet Language Transformations? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's just XSLT. Um, and these things are great. I mean, this is, for example, an example of an XSL template. Uh, this, this happened to come from the XML XSLT CPAN module, but um, you create templates in it, and they are fired when you hit that part of the XML, <coughs> but it's all in tree mode, and so you can do things like you can apply the templates again in, to the children of it, or you can save off state data or, or whatever. Um, you wouldn't want to deal with the... You'll have to learn the other language, but you can use Perl to wrap it. So you use these CPAN modules to tell Perl, hey, I have an XSLT file, go run it on this XML file and give me back the results in Perl format. Um, why do you care? Well, I mentioned 650 megabyte XML files. So, uh, when I worked with the Oxford English Dictionary, they would send us the entire dictionary, all 350,000 entries, in one file that was about 650 meg. And the first thing we did with it was split it out into 350,000 little XML files. <laughs> this was okay. We were using um, NSGMLS, actually, because it was SGML format at the time. This was before XML became very popular. Um, the trick is it took three days to run. Three days, like 65 to 68 hours every single time. We had a dedicated machine that just did this. We got everything else out of the way and let it run. So once uh, we got XSLT in-house, one of the guys who worked on XSLT before I started working with it, said, hey, let me, let me convert that to XSLT. Damn thing ran in 20 minutes. If you want speed, XSLT will be orders of magnitude faster. There are certain kinds of transformations that XSLT is really good at. Transforming one XML file into another kind of XML file. Say you get a SOAP request and you want to turn it into an XML RPC request. XSLT is great for that because you're translating this to that, this to that, this to that. Um, XLT is not very good at running your whole website display layer. Don't try it. <laughs> but, no matter how fast it looks. But, um, for the things that it's really good at, you cannot beat it. It is purpose built for speedy dealing with XML. So, CPAN lets you, you know, deal with those without too much hassle. So it's like a source to source translation kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, that's the, I mean, that's what it does best. Um, you can use it to pull data out and send it to various URLs, so like web services, if you have a REST API or something. Um, you can use it to um, process XML in a procedural way. Um, it gets kind of painful at that point. But the most natural kind of thing. But the natu most natural thing is translating XML into another format. Now, you can translate into non-XML formats. You have to go to some effort. 
but you can use XSLT to translate into CSV files, for example, or some, as long as the data supports it. I mean, if you have style data, it won't fit in the CSV file. Now, are you meaning XML, XSLT, when you say XSLT? XSLT is the language. Yes. A totally another language. XML, XSLT is a Perl wrapper around the lib XSLT, XSLT processor, uh -huh. which you give, so within XML, XSLT, you create your XSLT mm -hmm. script, mm -hmm. and then you give it the XML file, and you, in your Perl script, you use XML, XSLT to say, go run this style sheet on that file. Because most of the, the um, tutorial books out there, they're talking about running XSLT under Java, is that what you did? So, um, this one, XML Saxon XSLT2. So mm -hmm. Saxon is a Java-based XSLT engine. So when you run it from the command line, you run, you know, Java, Saxon, and you call in the, the whatever the class name is that you use to run it. Um, you don't involve Perl at all. But if you're already, if you're automating things, well, you're probably using Perl to do the automation. And say you want to run your XSLT as part of your automated structure. Like, um, say you're building a new machine and you need to modify all the default Tomcat configs. Mm -hmm. So you write a style sheet in XSLT that modifies those. You test it on the command line using Saxon and Java, and that works great. And then you automate it by putting it into XML Saxon so XSLT2. So you run one Perl script that fires off the JVM and loads up all the Saxon classes and runs the XSLT and then writes out a file as a result because it gives it back. Yeah. So what do you think about, say you generate your, your XML and you want to convert it to XHTML. I have a way to do that where I send the XSLT to the browser and have it do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should do it on the server with this module and then just send the XHTML to the browser. So um, that's a very good point. Browsers do implement a version of XSLT. It's a somewhat limited version, and it's incompatible between various different browsers. So like if you're only using IE, then you write your, your XSLT one way. If you're only using Firefox, you write it slightly differently. Um, it's better to do it on the server. WebKit, I think, has XSLT support, but I haven't tried it. If you do it on the server, you are in total control of the environment. And so there's one way to do it, and, you're gear and you can test to make sure that your HTML output is what you expect. If you send it down to the browser, you have no way to tell whether your output is what you expect. Right. So um, it's also faster to do it on the server. Now, the browser already has the engine implemented and running. Right. Um, but on the server, you know, the browser is running on a laptop computer, and the server is running on you know, horsepower in the data center. So, it will probably be faster on the server. You can also put a cache behind it, so you only have to translate it once, and not for every single request. So, I, you know, there are reasons for doing it in the browser. Um, if you want to use browser-specific details, like um, location services or, or stuff like that, i.e., I think. Anyway, there are some things that XSLT in the browser can do that you can't do on the server. But if you're just generating XHTML, then I'm looking at moving it to the server. Um, and you probably, I, I'd recommend Saxon for that. Um, LibXSLT is okay, but again, it's a little older. Um, it, it came with the, X, it's part of, uh, it's not part of LibXML. It was not part of XPath, but it was also developed by James Bond. So, as part of the design, it was like the reference implementation for the XSLT spec. So, it's kind of old and, and, you know, doesn't work so way. Whereas Saxon is, you know, pleasingly fast and modern and currently developed and, you know, so. But again, this is only if you have to do something that Perl is not very good at. Because you're shelling out to a whole other language. Try to avoid them the rest of the time. And the less said about X query, the better. If you need it, you know you need it. If you don't need it, don't wait. So, what have we talked about so far? We've talked about XML is structured data or style data. Why do you care? Well, perhaps you need to use it, or perhaps you have said style data that you want to deal with. It's implemented in various parsers, but you really don't want to do that. Instead, 
you want to use the stuff that's on CFAN. And which CFAN modules you use is entirely dependent on your application. There is more than one way to do it. Um, there's lots more here. There are um, there's documentation, there's you know various comparisons of various modules and things on the web. So uh, I recommend if you want to know more about XML, go look around, do a little research, see which of these modules work best for you. Um, maybe you want to write your own. So let's take a quick break for questions and then if you want, um, we can go into more detail on the code samples or um, I can tell you more stories from using <laughs> Perl and XML for 14 years. XPath is, is kind of like SQL in that it's a query language. But XPath, so if you only search XML? Yeah. Not any other? No. No, so, if you have HTML, that happens to be well-formed XML. So, like, there are some things you can do in HTML that can break an XML parser, but most of the XML parsers handle HTML pretty well. But, other than HTML and XML, no, XPath, totally worthless. Not even HTML5. Well, I mean, HTML5, if you're not doing anything too complex, it should work. Um, try and see. Uh, you know, there's, for example, um, if you're using, if you're using self-closing div tags in your HTML, browsers can deal with that, but if you try to validate against the HTML spec, it will fail, because div tags are not allowed to be self-closing in the HTML spec. Browsers implement support for it because everybody does it. But if you want to use XML tools on it, you may have to modify those and make them, you know, open and close tag with nothing in between. Um, there's, you know, just a few little things like that that can make HTML5 incompatible. But most of the time, if your code is clean, XML processing will be great. Mike. So you alluded to and then glossed right over it. Yes, I glossed right over the TV. So how, you know, back when I was actually using a lot of XML, I, I saw DTDs and I saw XSLT both used kind of in the same way, but XSLT looked like a more complete solution, and DTD was kind of a dirty way of doing it. So is that a fair assessment of how that's used? Um. Yes and no. Um, so uh, uh, what he's talking about is DTDs, which are used for document type validation. It's a, it's a document type description, DTD. And what it does is it says, these are the elements you can use. These are the attributes those elements can have. They can only come in this order. And they, you know, they better fit together like this. DTDs are really, really useful when you're validating a document. When you say, you know, I don't know where this came from. It could be crap. I want to make sure it's good before I deal with it. So I want to validate it against the DTD. Um, in addition to DTDs, you can also use XML schemas. You can use uh, RNG, relaxing. You can use um, uh, Schematron. You can use all sorts of ways to validate your document. Um, I don't prefer any one way over any other. Um, relaxing is a little easier to read. Um, if you've been working with SGML like I had even, you know, 20 years ago, um, DTDs just come naturally to me. So, um, you know, I don't find any problem with DTDs. They, one's not more, you know, slacker than the other. Um, there are lots of ways to do it, and it depends kind of on what you want to do. Like, Schematron can do things that DTDs can't do. Schematron is an XSLT-based language that lets you define tasks for your document. So a DTD can say, you need to have these elements in this order, and this element has to be one of these six things. You know, it's an enumerated set. 
Schematron can say, um, okay, I want to have these elements and I want to have them in this order, and this one has to have the word princess in it. You can't do that in the DTD. <laughs> But you can in Schematron because you write a specific rule that says, I want to check for the word princess. Sorry, I have two young girls, so. <laughs> can't mind. Um, you know, with uh, relaxing, which makes schemas and, you know, XML schemas, that's just another format for DTDs. It's a little easier to read. Um, relaxing is easier than XML schemas, which is supposedly easier than DTDs. I haven't worked a lot with um, schemas. They're not... You know, they do the same things DTDs do. Um, the people who have been working with XML the longest all use DTDs because they started with SGML, where DTDs were the only way to do it. Is that at all helpful? Yeah. Uh, so, if you have Java and you want to write in Java, You update your code? No, it does. It does. So the, the Xerxes parser that Java uses is up to date. The Xerxes parser that Perl uses is not up to date. The, the Xerxes team just quit bothering to port it. <laughs> so that's why it's stuck in 2007. But the Java version works great. And in fact, Java 6 um, upgraded their XML parsing. I forget exactly what they did to it, but um, I don't think it's Xerxes by default anymore. Um, it's something else. I haven't looked into what it is now. Um, but, you know, it, it's all modern, up-to-date, XML2, XPath2, um, everything. Is it, is it still open source or is it uh, run by audit? I don't know. Java itself? No, no, Java is But still we have problems when we come to higher versions of 7 and 9. Open JDK is not so very unsupported. Only to open JDK. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I've only worked with Saxon um, for dealing with XML with Java. I haven't worked with um, JDOM, for example, very much. Um, there are, there are other XML parsers for Java, so you don't have to use the one that comes with the JVM. You can, you know, load in your own. JDOM, J-D-O-M, is one of the more common ones. Um, it was written by a guy who worked at MarkLogic for a while. Um, I'm forgetting his name. Do you remember? Anyway, um, but uh, it works, you know, reasonably well. It creates a, a document object model, but it's generic. It's not just HTML. It's for all XML. So, I mean, you can always upgrade your XML parser in Java if you need to. So, when you say don't use Perl. Yeah, yeah, don't use it from Perl. Um, the reason I mentioned Java is because if you think doing XML in Java, like Java 1.4 in particular, is too complex, it's because it's Xerxes under the hood. <laughs> um, by Java 1.6, they kind of smoothed out the bumps about a lot, and I don't think it's Xerxes anymore, but... Um, it's a lot easier to use. So now, if you're doing modern Java programming, um, XML is kind of like a native file format. And it's very easy to parse and pull out the pieces and use XPath and all that. Do you, do you think someone will do what, follow the Saxon kind of pattern? Um, if, like say, if the Xerxes, you know, it's only being, you were originally going to be ported to Java, that someone will come up with a CPAM module that, you know, wraps, you know, um, the, um, the Java, you know, Java implementation of Xerxes, and, you know, kind of like I well, said, like kind of yeah, like, you know, so, um, because libxml is so fast and currently maintained, oh, okay, there's um, no reason to do that. Most people just go with libxml. Okay. So, xml atom happens to be written on libxml, and xml libxml uses the libxml to C parser, and so those get upgraded as, you know, time goes on. So because we have one really quite good one, There's no, yeah. most people will just convert rather than write a new one. Sure. Um, also, the C parsers are faster than the Java parsers. Okay. Right. So unless you're doing something like making a, um, a web service that you send it XML and it parses it and sends back you know, JSON, 
there'd be no point in using DOM before it. And in fact, you could do that very same thing with um, Plaque and XML Simple and um, JSON from Perl and just have it, you know, wait for stuff on a particular uh, URL and have it convert it using XML Simple, yeah. take the hash, output it as JSON, and send it back. Oh, so, I mean, you can, you can go back and forth that way. Yeah. What's Plaque? Oh, Plaque is awesome. Um, <laughs> Plaque is a, um, a web server written in Perl, written for Perl. So um, Ruby has this thing called Rack, mm -hmm. which is basically a quick and dirty, you know, here's your, you know, you define URLs and here's the handler that goes with it. Clack is the same way. You define URLs and here's the handler that goes with it. Um, the difference is Clack is an open API and so you can write Perl code that treats it as, as if it's CGI scripts. So it can convert things to environment variables that your Perl script reads and runs and then sends back whatever data it wants. And you can swap out on the back end too. So you can swap out the default Plaque server for say Starman, which is a um, uh, blindingly fast pre-forking server written in partly Perl and partly C. Um, the, and it, you know, like Mod Perl, it loads up all the stuff into memory and caches everything, and so um, it can, you know, serve web requests really fast, and it'll automatically recache everything when you change the file under the hood and, and all that stuff. It's, it's really handy, um, and it's very fast. <clears throat> if, you're, if you use Tomcat, Plaque fills the same role. It creates an application server. You can use it to serve HTML, but you can also use it to serve anything. P-L-A-C-K. Um, uh, let me see. It's... Uh... Oh, and I should mention that uh, it's a creation of, I believe it's Miyagawi-san? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, right, right, right. This is the iPad. Plaque. <laughs> Plaque Pearl. So, um, Plaque is really awesome. PSGI is the, the spec, and um, then there are a variety of HTTP servers that run on it. Starman is the, the high-performance pre-forking one. Um, it even handles socket interfaces. Um, wow, they've added a whole bunch more. I haven't seen Fearsome before. Um, LibEV. But again, because it's a, a, a spec, basically, you can implement the front and the back totally separately. So for example, um, there are a number of web frameworks in Perl that have now built in Plaque support. So you can run them on, like Mason, you can run Mason on its own server or you can run it on Plaque. And you write your Mason code once and then you want to deploy it to a Mason server for testing, great. You want to deploy it to a Plaque server for production, great, go for it. You know, you don't have to change your code at all. Um, Nginx has embedded Perl, which uses PSGI as well. Hey, cool. Yeah, so Catalyst and Gifty and CGI Application and Dancer and Mason and all of these support using Plaque servers. Even Mojolicious, Mojo -licious, which we had a great um, demo of a few months ago. Yes, that's right. Um, so something like kind of Plaque production. Uh, yeah. Similar to what VMware provides, Tomcat some new version is for production. Usually, use Tomcat for testing. Right, because because it's because Plaque uses the PSGI interface, um, you can swap back and forth, and you don't care. You don't have to change your code, so you can test without having to run the big full server. What is it? PSGI is the interface that Plaque defined. Uh -huh. So. Um, Right, so Plaque defined a core of, a Perl core, and then a, a spec. And so the reason there are so many servers and so many modules that support it is because they all support the spec. And then you can mix and match between them. 
So, you know, you don't want to set up Starman for your testing. Starman is way overkill. But you probably do want Starman on your actual, you know, production server. By compare like Java web server being Tomcat, saying that this is web server is PSVS. No, because Tomcat is a product, not a spec. Okay. Um, it's but really it's like. Is it like, a J2 in the reference model, right? Something like that? Tomcat? Yes, yes, oh, so yes, yes. So, so J2EE SDK uh -huh. is the, the spec. Right. And Tomcat is an implementation of the spec. Right. So in the same way, PSGI is like the SDK and Plaque is like Tomcat. Does that make more sense? The, this has nothing to do with XML, but, you know, it's just it's really cool. Um, so, any other questions? Otherwise, uh, I was What about XPath? XPath. Do you, is it use a lib, you know, XML, lib XML, XPath, or is it just XML, XPath? It's just XML, XPath. Um, it, um, it happens to be implemented on XML SACs under the hood. Mm -hmm. So, but you don't care about that. It's just XML, colon, colon, XPath. And if you um, look at it here on, um, actually, Let's do it this way. So if you look at XML XPath, come on. I'm feeling lucky. I'm not feeling lucky. Um, but if you, if you look at XML XPath, it has a really simple API. Basically, you create a new parser, and then you find nodes in it. You can tell whether something exists is, you, exists, you can run regexes against it, you can get the text out of it, and you can get nodes out of it, but, you know, basically you don't have to worry about most of that stuff. You just you instantiate the parser, you give it an XML file, and then you, you pull stuff out using XPath. Um, the trick is learning XPath itself, which can get kind of complicated and hairy if you want to get down to do fancy things. But the basic syntax is very straightforward. So, um, for example, uh, so as part of this presentation, I went ahead and implemented a bunch of sample XML um, for the purpose of being able to say, hey, yes, I have implemented this. Um, if you look, for example, at this one, right. So, um, if you look at this XML document, this is a Medline citation. Um, if you want to XPath into, say, the volume, you would have slash Medline citation, slash mm, article, slash journal, slash journal issue, slash volume. Now, since I happen to know that there's only one volume in this whole file, you can also do slash slash volume, and it'll give you that one value. But that's only because I happen to know that there's only one volume in each citation. Um, if you're looking for something like um, the authors, you know, there's more than one author. So if you did XML XPath to get down to the author, you would get back two entries in an array, and then you could deal with each one separately. Or if you looked for, say, give me all the last names, you could say, you know, this last name and that last name. There might be one farther down that's not part of an author, that's part of a contributor or something else. Um, and so you could even deal with all of those. Yes? So as you said before, if you just did slash slash last name, you get back the array of the process. Right. Yeah, no, the, the slash slash trick is, is awesome. Would, would, they, would they contain the path information in some way? No. So like if you had, no, okay. So if we said last name, but then down below there were contributors and a last name, you couldn't distinguish. Right. So if you actually want to distinguish between that, you need to have a slightly more complex XPath. You need to actually pull out the, um, the parent element, or in fact, if you want ones that are in the author list versus ones that are not in the author list, you have to go back another level, and your XPath would return nodes, which you could then use um, which you could then go find values on. For example, um, you can find nodes in a document, 
but then you can also you can check for matches within a node. So you can say, I got back nodes, and each one of these is a little tiny XML document. It's like a, a twig. Um, and then you can continue using XPath on it. So once you get back your list, you pull out the first part, and then you pull out the subparts that you want. This is an XML question, and you know, I don't know anything about it. But can you, does it handle strictly trees, or can it do, you know, directly to the grass where you have two things? No. no. No, there's no aliasing in XML. XML is one tree. I mean, part of the reason XML can be processed so quickly by certain programs is because there's no cycles. There's no loops even. If you want an if you want an array, you just have the same element multiple times in a row. Right. Yeah. And so there's nothing that says I'm supposed to have five of these, and then you only have four of them. Don't care if you have four of them. If you have five of them, these are the ones, and they get processed as a list. Um, it is one tree with one root node. Um, you were asking what um, things you could do in HTML to screw up XML processing. Have more than one root node. That'll really screw it up. <laughs> browsers deal with it. I don't know why, but browsers do. But even though you can't have loops, you can still decide, OK, the data I'm going to put in this node is an XPath path that refers to some other part, and just that would be part of the application logic. So, oh, okay. I mean, right. you could always kind of Right. right. You could you could alias it in your in your yeah. own code, but I'd recommend against it if you can help. It. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Next path question: Can I only have a single name, or can you have something like slash slash author slash last name? Yeah, yeah. No, you can. I mean, the slash slash can go anywhere in the path. Okay. So you could say, if you're looking here at our um, XML document. Um, you could, you could say, um, you know, I want author list slash slash last name. So I only want last names within the author list. And I don't care whether they're in an author or they're in a contributor that's also in the author list, but they've got to be in the author list. You can put the slash slash, you know, it's kind of like dot, dot, dot. You know, we have elided all of the details here. We don't care how many layers we go down. Tell us one of your stories how you actually use this. <laughs> well, um, I parsed Medline data. Um, no, so um, uh, when I worked on the Oxford English Dictionary, um, they really did send us one file. Um, at first, they mailed us a tape, and then they FedExed us to tape. This was in 1998, and then by 2000, they were FedExing us to tape, and then by 2001, 2002, they were mailing us a CD, and. Um, by 2004 or 5, they were FTPing the file over to us. But, you know, it's this 600 to 700 meg single XML file, one tree, all the way down with the entire dictionary in it every three months. What did you do? Uh, I, was, I was curious. Where so um, I worked with Highwire Press, a division of Stanford University, where which publishes academic journals and publications on the web. And so the Oxford English Dictionary contracted with us to run their website. So they handled all the data. I could not make up my own words. <laughs> um, I asked. And uh, they did let me do one thing, though, and don't, you, well, Sandy never found out. Um, they let, so they had a word of the day, and they let me pick the word of the day on my birthday. <laughs> so they had, they, had a, um, um, they had a program on their end that would generate a list of words of the day. They had to be interesting, they couldn't be just a redirect to something else, they couldn't be entirely obsolete, you know, they had to have more than one definition, so, you know, if you just have a word like, say, um, plumage, you know, there's really, there's one definition of this and, and it's not very interesting. So they would, they would do words that were much more interesting, but not too big. For example, um, uh, the entry for the word set and the entry for the word run are the two largest entries in the entire dictionary. They have hundreds of different meanings. I mean, think about how many things run, how many things are set. They are just, you know, humongous. Just lots of definitions, lots of, of interesting, you know, connotations and stuff. And so, um, what we did was they sent us the dictionary file and we ran the website. And um, so, you know, we would parse that file into HTML, and we would parse it out and put it into um, a Sybase database, 
and we would parse it out and put it into a different XML format and put it into a full text search engine. And then we wrote the code that ran the website and tied it all together and handled, you know, usernames and passwords and, and all of that stuff. So the Oxford Online Dictionary wasn't actually at Oxford. No, it was hosted <laughs> in Palo Alto. <laughs> um, they have since left uh, Highware Press and they're now being hosted by themselves in actual, I think they're actually in London, I think their data center is in London, but um, they, when they left Highware, their website, you know, they wanted a fancy redesign and, you know, all new things and they asked us to bid on it and we said, oh my god, this is going to cost, you know, millions of dollars. And uh, they said, we're, we're going to go somewhere else. They went somewhere else. Turns out they couldn't implement a single one of those things that would have cost multi-millions of dollars. <laughs> and it cost them more to build their next website than it would have to have us build it. But that's the way business works. So I no longer have any access to the Oxford Dictionary Alliance. Mm. That's a cool story, though. Mm -hmm. So another question here. Uh, mm -hmm. We have not talked about anything about the types. Like, if you go back, you started with BPD. Generally, PCBT, they did not have any types. It was just strings. Mm -hmm. And when you move here to XML, you have no little there, you have all the types. So, does it, uh, the simple model that path, Next path? does it support that kind of thing? Yeah, so um, um, this, is, this is actually something that I, I'm, I'm, I spent a lot of time finding, and I wanted to show you all. Um, let's see what I can make that a little bigger. Oh, come on. No, 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 no. <sighs> All right. He's doing fancy things with his website. So, um, <laughs> so text is no longer ASCII. This is, this is what you're getting at. Um, back in the old days, text was ASCII. There were... 128 characters, that was good enough for my dad, it was good enough for me, it was, you know, God good enough for everybody. <laughs> Who needs more than 640K? I'm not <laughs> um, then people decided, well, hey, but, you know, what about my Enya? What about my um, characters in French with accents? What about my characters in um, Swedish or um, Chinese or, you know, Japanese or, or whatever? So there was this huge consortium called the Unicode Consortium that came up with this new way of structuring text and encoding text called Unicode. And they developed several standards underneath that. The winner is UTF-8, um, which is Universal Text Format 8. It's, because, it's 8 because they're 8-bit bytes. Um, no, they're 8-byte characters? But Oh, they're multiple. Yeah, you can. They use up to four. Right, right, right. You can have up to four characters, but they're eight-bit characters. Right. Yeah. So it can be one, two, three, four, eight-bit. So the the winner in most of the world, except Windows, is UTF-8. <laughs> <laughs> um, UTF-8 lets you encode anything, any character, including a whole humongous set of emoji. Um, which are included by default in Apple's fonts now. Um, in, in fact, um, I happen to have the emoji keyboard installed here, and each of these is a single character as encoded in the UTF-8 namespace, basically. Each one has a number that is up to four bytes long, and um, they tell you, you know, like there's flags and cars and <laughs> every smiley face you could possibly imagine and like um, I like the devil smiley faces <laughs> anyway um, so with UTF-8 came the realization that most of our tools couldn't deal with these special characters when XML was defined they said hey this is the future we're gonna require you to use UTF-8 for all your text so, to be true XML, it pretty much has to be UTF-8. You can specify another encoding if you try hard, but you'll get blowback from, like, Java, for example, will... You'll have to warn it more than once that you're not using UTF-8. Um, and various other, you know, weirdness. So, 
what happens is suddenly all our tools that, de that were built on ASCII, ASCII were out of date. And they would break at the first sign of someone putting a special character into a web form. Um, which, on some keyboards, they're actually, you know, main keys. You don't even have to sh shift to get these things in there. Um, so XML was defined with UTF-8. So when you deal with XML, you also have to deal with Unicode characters. Um, everyone using Perl, if you get input from anywhere that is a human being, you should be dealing with Unicode anyway and UTF-8. You really should. It is, however, a true pain in the ass. Um, unless you're using Perl 5.14 or later. Perl 5.10 started having decent UTF-8 support. Perl 5.12 had better uh, UTF-8 support. Perl 5.14, it's solid. And in fact, um, Tom Christensen, who is kind of the Perl Unicode guru at this point, um, did a talk at OSCON 2011. Uh, he did three talks. And I did finally manage to find the slides from him. But the, the best part of it is, is this table here. This table here that shows Unicode support across multiple languages as of October of 2011. And if you look down here, these are all the various parts of Unicode. So for example, it's internally represented as UTF-8, or UTF-16, or UCS-2, uh, <laughs> or whatever. And then there are various features of the encoding. For example, identifiers. You can have special characters that um, identify things like, you know, bell. Like the, you know, ring the, the console bell, that kind of thing. We've got um, words that identify things like alpha num for any alphanumeric character. That is a feature of Unicode. Um, case folding, for example, if you've got an A with a circle on top, what's that called? Do you know? No, no not, not the umlaut, but um, in, in Swedish. No, you don't know? Okay. Anyway, if you have an A with a circle on top, and you make it a capital letter, it becomes a capital A with a half circle on top. You can't just, you know, make the glyph go up and down. But there's another language that has a capital A with a real circle on top. And that's a totally different character. And the angstrom, which is a capital A with a circle on top, is a totally different character. Because that has a different meaning than the letter A with a circle on top in, um, you know, Scandinavian languages. So changing case from upper and lower case things is becomes suddenly very complex. Um, mapping the cases where you can say any lowercase character, this will match any lowercase character, any uppercase character. Um, graphemes, like, you know, um, I think that refers to, like, Chinese and uh, other languages that are not, um, they're symbolic. Well, yeah, they're, I mean, symbols mean words or parts of words as opposed to um, letters. Yes, sir. German SS? Yeah, the German SS is, is one. Yeah, that's a graphene. Because it's two characters, SS, but it's implemented. Um, it's usually printed as a beta in some cases, but in the lower case, it's an SS. Um, but so that, you know, it goes from one character to two characters. And, so there are all these features of Unicode that make it challenging. And if you look across the top here, we've got JavaScript support is pretty lacking. And PHP support is, well, OK, but they deal with like simple case folding. So they'll let you change case for Latin languages, but not um, complicated languages. Um, Go, which is Google's special programming language, um, isn't even as good as PHP, because PHP allows for normalization. So where you can say, strip all the accents off of this. I want, you know, it's a French word like cafe with an accent on it. Strip the accent off because it doesn't matter. But those A's with a circle on top, that's a different letter, so don't strip those off. Those aren't an accent. <laughs> um, Ruby, Python, Java, and Perl. And as of Perl 5.14, Perl has the... <laughs> Perl has the most complete support for Unicode of any major programming language. Built in, from scratch, part of the system. You don't have to do a darn thing. If you're using Perl 5.16, all of your strings are UTF-8, all of your file handles are UTF-8, everything is UTF-8 from the ground up. And you don't worry about it anymore. You can go back to pretending that it's ASCII. <laughs> you say 
U C Perrin dollar string Perrin and it uppercases it. It doesn't care whether it's in English or Spanish or Scandinavian or Chinese. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, you several put that people. Link on the website? What? Can you put that link on the website. Yes. That'd be great. Um, several people have said that this could be Pearl's killer feature for people doing internationalization because. If you're trying to do this, and now he doesn't have, he has Java listed here, and Java defaults to UTFS, UTF-16 because of Windows, but you can set it in UTF-8 mode, and it contains, you know, it does most everything. Graphemes, there are modules to do that, but they don't come built in. Um, UCA collection, I don't even know what that is. Named characters, nobody hardly uses, so while Perl supports them, nobody uses them, so it doesn't matter. But Perl support of Unicode is is the best of the lot if you're using 514 only. And here's the thing is that if you're on the web with people from other countries, you should be using Unicode because someone will come along from China and try and type their name in your web page. Uh huh. And they have that keyboard because that's how they do all their work. Mm -hmm. And they'll be thrilled that it actually worked. Yeah. One of the issues I'm dealing with right now is we, we, we've got a number of defect management, project management tools that we all want to talk to each other in different ways. Mm -hmm. And all of them deal with Unicode in different ways. Mm -hmm. yes. And they all come in XML in different ways. And the China team files above, and they simply attach the file. What does the file name look like? What's it supposed to look like? Right. How do you tell this system is using Ruby APIs that this system, which is using Java APIs, <coughs> yeah. so put the kernel in the middle is the right answer there. Yeah. And, and Perl can, you know, do conversions between things. For example, one of the great things is this normalization, where you can say, you know what, I'm going to strip out all the accents to give me the lowest possible um, common denominator. This, you know, reduces the set of potential characters from um, 65,000 times 4 down to more or less 65,000, um, which is, you know, a much more reasonable thing to work with. Um, you know, Perl makes a great buffer in there. And if you're using your entire stack using Perl, like something like Plaque, which is written in Perl, um, with C under the hood in a few places, um, then your UTFA savvy all the way. Um, and you don't have to think about it anymore. Now, you have to think about it in terms of file names, because your operating system may not deal with it. Or you have to think about it in terms of your database, because your database probably doesn't deal with it by default. Um, but if you're using XML files instead of a database, say you've got um, um, Hadoop or uh, MongoDB, and you get an XML file, and well, not Mongo, but say you're using you know Hadoop or something where you can just store blobs, you know, get an XML file, store it as a blob, get an XML file, store it as a blob, pull it back out, it's still a blob, nobody touched it, nobody modified it, you know, you use it straight through. Um, MongoDB is a little weird because it uses JSON but it can include blobs inside your JSON, so it sort of kind of works. But. So what we need is DBI class for <laughs> XML. Windows uses Yeah. So UTF-16 uses 16-bit bytes, and you can have four of them, so there's many, many more potential characters. Um, but the whole... So the, the number space of Unicode is all mapped out in advance. So, like, you know, page one is ASCII and extended ASCII and uh, ISO Latin 1. Um, 8859 1 is the other standard name for it. Um, and then you go into page two, which has, you know, all the accent, the extra extended characters and some of the other things, like, you know, right to left languages and all that. And you go all the way down to the many, many deeper pages, which include the emoji and, uh, for example, um, the OED has pronunciations. And they're the Oxford English Dictionary. They've had pronunciations since the dawn of time. Um, well, at least since 1906, 1908, 1908. Um, they invented their own alphabet for pronunciations. They got a section of the Unicode standard to include their particular alphabet. So there's a section of Unicode character numbers that are only used by the Oxford English Dictionary and nobody else. So they're not the same as Merriam-Webster? No. Mm -hmm. No, so there's an International Phonetic Alphabet, IPA, 
And the OED, because they started first, they do not use IPA. Now, I have to tell you, when I was working with them, I begged and pleaded for them to convert, and they said no. <laughs> because certain of their features couldn't be represented in IPA, in the International FedEx Alphabet. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't so. need to be international. What is the UCS 2 and UCS 4? What? What is UCS 2 and UCS 4 are there? I don't remember what UCS 2 and UCS 4 are. Is it also some so it's, so an, it's another it's encoding standard so for it. The UCS2 is essentially the same as UTF-16, and UCS4 is essentially the same as UTF-32. So they are 8 and 16. Uh, yeah, UCS2 is 16-bit, and UCS4 is 32-bit. So Python is kind of looking ahead to when we need even more characters. <laughs> um, but most people are not supporting UCS2 yet, unless you happen to be using Python. Um, there is some support in JavaScript, there's some support in you know, various other languages. Like, in Perl, you can use the encode module and re-encode stuff however you like. There are encoding modules for UCS2, there are encoding modules for UTF-16. But, you have to do it explicitly. So every single string in every single Perl script you write should be UTF-8 safe. Or other encoding. You have to specify your encoding on the inputs, you have to specify it on the outputs. That's a whole other presentation. <laughs> if you happen to be using Perl 5.8, I wish I could help you. <laughs> I have lost many, many, many hours of my life to making UTF-8 work in Perl 5.8 because that's what um, Armor Press uses still. Um, yeah, I wish I could make it happier. It will be cheaper and easier in the long run to upgrade. Okay, let's take one more question. Yeah. Any more questions? Cool. So uh, I will um, try and get these um, slides in a format that can be posted online. Um, since I did all the work on my iPad, its export options are kind of limited. Um, but I will see what I can do and, and see if we can get it posted up somewhere so that everyone can have a copy. Oh, Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, oh, Mr. Right. Friedman, for Thanks, that presentation. Graphene. Oh, graphene. Graphene, smallest semantically distinguishing unit in the written language analogous to the phone in the Oh, okay. <laughs> it's phony. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs>